I want to take a look at um, that experience of a boy growing up in Rome and not just of the upper classes. Here's obviously a very a wealthy young man. Uh, this is from uh, actually Roman Crete in Heraklion. But um, we're not just going to look at the elites, although we have more information from them. So think about growing up as a boy per class, senatorial class, equestrian class, the commoner, the plebeian class. Uh, what if you are living in Rome and you're a foreigner? You're not even Roman, but you can still grow up. You can legally be residing in Rome. Um, what if you're a freed slave, libertus or liberta? What if you are a slave? Uh, this term verna, sorry, Sarah was verna is actually um, when slaves have children, their children are property as well. So you know it's 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 very uh, complicated if we just want to talk about growing up as a boy in ancient Rome, because there, there's just a huge variety of experiences that you could have. What is your household like? You know, what do your parents do for a living? What are, what's your education going to be? Just like today, when you grow up and, um, you know, it's not necessarily growing up in your family that, oh, I'm going to go to college. Maybe your family can't afford college. Uh, maybe no one in your family has gone to college, this sort of thing. So, Think about this wide uh, variety of experiences of, of boys growing up. Also consider these families, and we and we have their stories told. We have records of this. We have inscriptional evidence. We have uh, histories, and these people are included. What if you're a child growing up in a household where your dad is a Praetorian Guard member? He's going to have a much higher pay scale, more prestige, more, uh, in the end, political connections. Uh, what if your, so, your your dad is a soldier in the provinces or is in the navy? Uh, now, up until really the into the second century, you're not supposed to, uh, you're not allowed to be married. Now, be that as it may, people had, um, you know, informal wives and would have children. And then typically when you finished your service and you got citizenship, then your marriage whether on the down low or your informal marriage would be recognized and your children would be legitimate as well. What if you grow up Jewish, right? Totally different religion from the majority of people in the Roman Empire. Uh, so there's different experiences, uh, different boy, you know, childhood uh, that we have that we can, can, can imagine um, throughout the far reaches of the empire. Think about entertainers. Again, a lot of these people are not even citizens, the actor, the singer, the gladiator, a slave, charioteer, and so forth. But again, they can have relationships. They can have children. And again, ultimately, if they do become freed, then those other family members are given legitimacy. So the person that runs the show, though, the person that's going to have the say, the final say on the boy growing up, is going to be the paterfamilias, so the head of household. And going to manage the financial assets of the whole household will legally be in charge of the child. So this child is deformed. This child is ill. I'm going to expose. I'm going to discard this child. I'm not going to recognize this child as mine. They have the right to do that. Um, they are responsible for registering the birth, in the temple of Saturn. This happens in the time of Augustus. Um, they're going to arrange the marriages for the children, both the daughters and the sons. They don't have children, they're going to adopt. And that's a whole other procedure as well. Who are you adopting? Well, you tend to adopt someone who's a relative. So again, all these, all these different issues open up uh, just very complicated uh, stories. There's legalities, there's legislation involved. So anyways, Coming uh, just to it very uh, briefly, the father has the right to recognize the son as his own uh, after nine days. So before then, is the child going to live? Think about infant mortality rates. In the beginning, is very critical. The same thing is going to go for the girls, typically a little bit less, uh, eight days versus nine days. And then you're going to name that child, and that child is now officially recognized as yours. Uh, here's an example um, that I put up on a video on that newly opened necropolis to the Vatican. Here's this little boy, uh, Neutronius Venistus, 
Tiberius Vinturius Venistus, and look at that. He lived uh, four years, four months, and 10 days. Don't quite start. And we'll, we'll come back to that in just a moment. Okay, so if you are recognized, if you are um, living beyond the, the nine days, uh, what's going to happen to you? Well, number one is, uh, you know, kids can get in a lot of trouble. But if you're uh, not yet at puberty, about 14 years old or so, if you do something really naughty, capital offense or theft or whatnot, arson, well, you are exempt from capital uh, punishment. So that's that's actually good to know. Just like we have in our laws today when some heinous crime is is uh, you know perpetrated by some youngster and then is it the state going to try that person as an adult or not? Uh, but here, the Roman law, by and large, it, it, you're exempting those young kids. Okay. So what about the child growing up? Where are they going? So we want to think about them in that generic kind of house. Where are they going to be? So in some places like the atrium, it's for the master, the dominus, his clients, the clients, the friends, the amicus can go into more places, more leisure uh, places. And the kids are throughout the house then playing uh, in their own cubiculum, okay, but also in the peristyle court and so forth. Maybe they're running off to the cucina, the kitchen, and getting something to eat. And they're going to be minded by various slaves. Of course, the mother has her role managing the household, as the father does the more uh, public uh, activities, meeting with clients or himself being a client and going to his dominus and, and his uh, maybe master or former master if he's a freed slave. The only thing about the children within these spaces, school. Okay, so the first thing is if you have a child, you don't necessarily want to, the mother doesn't necessarily want to nurse that child. So you have a wet nurse and that wet nurse is then part of the familia, the extended family of, of the ancient Romans. And also you have this figure, the pedagogue, who oftentimes is Greek, sometimes a slave, sometimes a freed person that is going to be accompanying this little youngster throughout his day, babysitting, to taking a walk, to escorting him to school, if they're not getting school at home, taking him to the baths, going to the theater. So there's, there's, this pedagogue is, again, a member of that family who then remains a member of the family um, well after the, the child has grown up and become a man. Uh, where you're lear learning traditionally in the Republican times, you were taught by your parents, you're taught by your dad in particular, and you learned at home, and of course, another situation with the passing of time is public schools, or you don't have that opportunity at home, uh, then you're going to go to a particular, and teachers get uh, reputations and so forth, and, and you send your kids there uh, to a public space that's rented out, like in the portico of one of the forum spaces. So you read and write and learn math right at home. And then you are going to be put in with the grammaticus, and you're going to learn a lot of different uh, things. Hopefully for you, your parents can afford it, and they have that uh, background themselves. You want to learn Latin and Greek. Okay, so that's the way you become that educated member of society, Latin and Greek, not just Latin. And then if you're going all the way through to have a public career, right? You're not working in a shop. You're not, you're not a carpenter. You're not a, a cobbler. Then you want to learn the art of public speaking. And if anything, you go even further and you're working with and learning from different teachers, philosophers throughout the Mediterranean, then you're going to basically doing a study abroad. So a famous place to go in the time of Cicero was Athens, among other places. The athletics are big. Running, wrestling, swimming, and then again, again, think of uh, economic limitations. But if you don't have them, you're going to learn horseback riding as well. Swim in the Tiber. And then eventually you have the big bath complexes where you can learn to swim. Uh, but wrestling, running, these are kind of the basics. And, uh, and uh, as you grow up and as you become more independent, you're going to be socializing within the house, on the street in the porticos, in the gymnasiums, the bath complexes, and ultimately as a young adult male, you're gonna be in the forum, right? That's not a place by and large uh, for women, it's for the male citizens. So here's the big, here's the kicker. You're gonna become a man. 
And when he becoming a man around 15 or 16 years old, again, people could get betrothed and married even as early as 14. That's a little less usual. Uh, you have a protective amulet that you're given after you've reached that nine-day period. You now recognize as a member of the family. You wear it around your neck. It's a good luck charm. It's a protective amulet. It can be gold. It can be leather. It can even be made of cloth. And when you're going to give it up, that you don't need that protection anymore, you dedicate it to the household shrine in your home, and you're replacing your little boy toga with the man toga, pure white toga virilis. And now, as a sign of that, you go with your family to the forum, you're announced as a citizen, and you're officially enrolled in the family tribe, which means you can vote. And it's a sacrifice to the Temple of Jupiter Optimus Maximus. This is what you do in Rome. Otherwise, you're doing it at any Capitolium temple in any given city. And then you have a banquet at home where you're going to get drunk. Because usually the day that you, that you choose to celebrate is March 17th. There are other dates. But this is the standard one. And the Liberalia is dedicated to Liber, and Liber is Bacchus. So drinking. You're now a man. We're going to get you drunk. Okay, now in the military, it's like this. You would serve in the military because you're a Roman citizen, and as a Roman citizen, you have the right to vote because you have a plot of land. When the property requirement is no longer there by about 100 BC in the Marius reforms, then you have two things that are gonna happen. You're either in the upper classes and you're going in as a kind of, well, basically like an upper-class uh, officer. You're automatically, like you went to ROTC or something. You, know, you just got out of West Point. You don't know anything, but because you went to West Point, they're going to put you in some position of decision-making. So they have this kind of political military positions. Tribunus Laviclavis, Tribunus uh, Angusticlavis. Um, just means wide and narrow a stripe on your, on your uh, tunic. But most people aren't from the upper classes. So you enlist, you do 25 years of service, and when you're done, now your common law, common, common law wife, as it were, right now is now going to be officially recognized as your wife. And the kids that you've fathered, right, they're not recognized as citizens as well. That happens after you retire, after 25 years of service. Think about the U.S. right now. You sign up for the military. You sign up for three years. You want to re-enlist. Sign up for another three years or what have you. Instead, for the Romans, when you sign up, you're signing up for 25 years. That's a commitment, and you can't get out of it. You can't change your mind. You can't say, nah, I actually want to go to college now. Can't do it. 25 years of service. But it is, for many people, afterwards, a path to citizenship if they're not already a citizen. Okay, so think about that little boy growing up, playing with little... Uh, his little action figure, like a little gladiator figure here. And then think about the, the end all result of what kind of reality the boy growing up will face. Is he sold off into slavery and himself becomes a gladiator because he's a slave? The person that enlists in the military and distinguishes himself, retires with a big chunk of money and a plot of land. And it's just many different avenues for a person in the Roman Empire. We have great, uh, great images of, of, uh, of families from various periods. This one's from, uh, we talked about these bronzes from San Cashano. So it's getting into the end of the Republican period, but it is a little boy with a toga. It's like, that's kind of how you'd imagine him before he takes a toga of manhood. Here's a boy. This is in the Met in New York uh, with his little pet dog. Uh, he, he doesn't live to uh, adulthood, but he's nevertheless mourned by his family. We have tons and tons and tons of tombs and offerings to deceased children, as you can imagine. So dis manibus, to the, to the, um, the souls of the departed. An example from um, the, the Basilica of Herculaneum, thinking about that idea of pedagogue and teaching and grammaticus. Here's Chiron with the child uh, Achilles. Kind of underlining the importance of education. Here's a bronze statue that most people ignore when they go into the uh, Galleria Borghese, but this is most probably a, one of the emperors of the Antonine period uh, that is actually depicted here. So again, think about in, in, in all families of all levels. And of course here, 
and the beautiful bronze statue uh, that's encapsulating, kind of capturing the essence of this young boy who was destined to become one of the emperors of Rome. There's a lot of kids. They don't have that opportunity, and they're working in a felonica, as you see the little child here. Um, here is a person accompanying his father, maybe, or just a slave attendant. We're not exactly sure, but it looks like a little, it looks like a boy. And they're getting a bread handout in Pompeii. Or here's a shopping scene in the forum where people are buying utensils or whatnot. So we do see children all the time in Roman art. Here's a very typical scene too, erotic art in your bedroom. And there is a little slave attendant looking out at us saying, do you believe what's happening in front of me? So you kind of imagine then the roles of different people in society, including enslaved people that are part of the familia of a, of a successful, wealthy uh, Roman, and then the way in which those individuals, those human beings are treated as servants, as chattel, as property, as attendants. As you see this little figure here. Uh, this one here, it's, uh, it's quite nice. It's from Stabia. We just looked at this in our Vesuvian Cities course. And uh, and I was talking about this one uh, with Fred Kleiner, who's a very uh, prominent, uh, now retired uh, archaeologist and art historian from Boston University. And he says, I think this, I think we were talking about this thing. This is like the quintessential mama's boy <laughs> uh, image here, <laughs> something like that. We, what's the story here? We don't know. Uh, this one here, it looks like the boy is being stretched out and his pants are missing. So oftentimes it's, it's been interpreted as, as this forum scene in Pompeii where it's either a, you know, a slave that's being uh, punished or it's a school child who's in trouble and he's getting whipped by the teacher. I mean, just, you know, these things are subject to interpretation. Also think about handouts, the alimenta that the uh, Roman emperors are going to institute from Trajan and onward. And we have examples here. We have children, a baby child on the right-hand side that's uh, talking to an emperor who's defaced. On the left here, we have Hadrian. But again, it's this handout that's given to people that weren't so fortunate. So you have the state, kind of an initial kind of welfare state that's enacted by the, the Roman emperors. Here are late antique father and son. So again, we're thinking about, I'm going to do just what dad does. And in this case here, they're holding napkins. They're about to drop the napkin and start the Circus Maximus chariot races. Um, so a lot of, lot of great examples of, of uh, boys growing up here as servants in the house of the Vedii. Here is obviously from a very prominent family in Roman Crete. And this figure here in that, uh, that archaeological site, the, the newly opened um, necropolis there of the Vatican that we were talking about. So just four years old, four months and 10 days. So that's one burial. And uh, we have religious scenes oftentimes depicted as being enacted by, by children, which is a kind of just fun light motif, sometimes as Cupid figures, but in this case here is children venerating uh, Diana. Um, sometimes they're gonna be working in shops, assisting their parents to become uh, carpenters themselves, like this example from Monte Martini. And this one here is a little uh, Lanterarius, who's a slave attendant with a, a lantern, and he's fallen asleep. There's a little boy, uh, enslaved boy, that was his duty to um, light the lantern, and he's fallen asleep waiting for his master. And this also is part of a tomb decoration from that uh, wonderful necropolis in the Vatican. So this is an extraordinary little piece. It's not the only one that exists. Like this is quite frequently depicted, but this one is, is pretty exquisite. This video has been brought to you through a grant from the CAAS Mashantonio Award.